right, why don't we get started? Hi, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Becca Kearns, and I am involved in marketing here at Academic Studies Press. We are very excited to welcome two authors this evening, uh, Elena Limbersky and Elena Gorakova, to talk about their recent books as a part of ASP, our ASP in Conversation event series. Before getting started, we wanted to let you know that both Elena's and Elena's books are available for purchase wherever books are sold. And we especially encourage you to purchase them through your local independent bookstore or through bookshop.com Org, which helps support local bookstores. Please feel free to send any questions that you may have throughout the event into the Q&A box as there will be a time for questions from the audience at the end after both authors have read from their books and have had a chance to discuss. This event will also be recorded and made available to watch at a later date. And now to introduce our two authors. Elena Lombersky is an author of two books. Her work appeared in World Literature Today, Forward, and Cardinal Points Literary Journal. Elena grew up in Leningrad, now St. Petersburg, and immigrated to the USA in 1987. She holds degrees in art and architecture from MIT and the University of Michigan. She's granddaughter of Felix Lembersky, 1913 to 1970, a prominent Soviet Jewish artist with roots in Ukraine, who is best known for his paintings in the of the Babin Yar Massacre, the Holocaust site near Kiev. Elena now lives near Boston. Elena Gorokova was born and raised in Leningrad, now St. Petersburg, Russia. After graduating from Leningrad University, she moved to the United States, carrying one suitcase with 20 kilograms of what used to be her life. Elena is the author of two memoirs, A Mountain of Crumbs and Russian Tattoo. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, The Daily Beast, New Jersey Monthly, and The Daily Tele Telegraph, as well as on NPR and BBC Radio, and in a number of literary magazines. A Trying to Moscow is Elena's first novel. She lives and teaches in New Jersey. For more information, visit www.elenagorakova.com. And with that, I will turn it over to Elena. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure and it's an honor uh, for me to um, present uh, my work with uh, Elena Gorokova. Uh, whose work I had followed and um, really admire. Um, we, in our previous conversations, uh, found uh, many things that we have in common, that we share, in addition to being born and living um, in the same city. Um, so I will uh, speak uh, about my book and um, read a few excerpts um, after that, uh, Elena will uh, uh, talk about uh, her work um, and um, about her uh, wonderful novel, uh, A Train to Moscow. And um, after that, we will uh, talk and open uh, later open uh, these two questions. So um, the title of my uh, memoir, Like a Drop of Ink, in a downpour comes from a poem that my mother um, uh, wrote in the 1960s uh, when she was in her early 20s and before um, I was born. Uh, and the poem um, with really eerie, eerie precision uh, anticipates uh, the turn of uh, events uh, in in the following 20 years of her life. Uh, we included that poem in the um, memoir, so I will not um, read it right now. Uh, so I grew up in Leningrad in the 1970s. And uh, in the 70s and 80s, there was still a very long shadow of war uh, on our streets, World War II. Leningrad was um, besieged by, uh, by the Nazi Germany uh, and there was 900 days of um, siege and hunger, a million people died. Um, and even years later, 25, 30 years later, um, we would still be finding uh, rusted bullets um, and in the forest. Um, and I remember my friend, uh, a seven-year-old boy, would tell me not to touch those bullets because they might 
uh, explode. And in this pit, there would be invalids, amputees, uh, people who would get around on boards. I would see uh, on little, little children wheels, they would um, push themselves with board uh, pieces of wood um, and get around. Um, and uh, just a few days ago, uh, we had uh, watched Russia celebrate uh, the Victory Day, in May 9. Uh, I remember those um, anniversaries on May 9, and they were very different from what we saw a few days ago. Uh, there was never this military macho display. What I remember that was a somber, thoughtful, um, sorrowful uh, day. Um, people would, uh, the veterans would go down the street, and um, my grandmother. Uh, and my grandfather both survived the siege, and my grandmother would tell me stories about um, her living in the city, um, how she would uh, stand guard on the roof of the Academy of Art uh, with a bucket of sand, and if uh, the firebomb hit the roof, she would throw, had to throw the sand under uh, the fire to put, uh, so that the building doesn't catch on fire. So the, the the slogans back then were uh, peace to the world, uh, no one is forgotten, and never again. So I I want to read the first excerpt um, that has to do that I believe uh, has something to do with the war, um, and the um, so and the excerpt is about men. Um, so there were many grandmothers in the and old women in the neighborhood, but uh, there were very few men. So this uh, piece is about them. More than 30 years have passed since the war, but it's still present in our neighborhood. There are few men over 50 and old women pamper them. When our old neighbor comes down stairs to sit on a bench by our front door, women sweep back locks of their gray hair and stop gossiping. What a sweet scented day, Ivan Ivanovich, just marvelous. But there is also another kind of man in our neighborhood. In the evening, I see one of them sleeping on the bench, knees to his chest like a baby. Just before lying down, he pees on the um, tree and vomits yellow puddles onto the footpath. Don't look there, grandmother, tell, uh, grandma tells, uh, says to me and takes my me by the hand to cross the street. In America, there is a term for the, his condition, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. But in Russia back in the 70s, we knew them simply as boozers, alcoholics, untouchables. They sit in the back of our common yard behind a poplar tree and a dumpster. Uh, there they have a table and seats made of crudely sewn planks that give you splinters if you're not careful. Their sleeveless undershorts are rarely washed. They have tattoos and gray stubble. A van delivers a cistern of beer to our common yard, and they all line up. Then back to their seats to play dominoes. The loser buys the next round. The table is sticky and damp with a sour smell. They drink al from aluminum mugs, smoke cheap tobacco rolled in newspapers and cough up phlegm. Grandma doesn't let me go there because the ground is covered with spit and broken glass. The spit is multicolored, white and yellow from the flu, gray and green from smoking, gray and black with a smudge of red from tuberculosis. The spit coalesces with the tobacco ash. Smoke and profanities hang in the air. The men's uh, eyes are pink and napes of their backs, uh, and the napes of their necks maroon with black dirt trapped in their wrinkles. After the game, they stagger off. They have no women despite the shortage of men. Grandmothers stay away. So this is, um, this is uh, what I saw in the streets in the 70s. Uh, my, um, I lived with my uh, mother and my grandmother in a small apartment, two bedroom apartment uh, in the, um, new neighborhoods that we called Novostroiki. 
And um, right there in my home, there were also 500 uh, paintings by my grandfather, Felix Lemberski. He died when I was one year old, but he remained uh, in our home with uh, his paintings and with the objects of his art. Uh, his brushes were on, uh, stood in a vase on a TV, on top of TV, uh, stacks of uh, drawings uh, on our bookshelf, and our one and only walk-in closet was filled with his oils and um, and framed works. Um, for political reasons, uh, most of his. Uh, so, so I'll just show quickly. Uh, this is the first book that I that they published. This is his self-portrait, and uh, I don't know if you can see. I'll just flip through. This is some of his work. Uh, this painting is called uh, Midday Crucifixion. And there is a lot of hidden symbolism in his work. Uh, this is reclining. This, I'm sorry for the reflection. Uh, so his, um, yeah, so his work for, most of his work for political reasons could not be exhibited in uh, Russia because it does, did not fit with the state-mandated socialist uh, realism. And uh, the only place to see it was in our home. So um, the guests, uh, friends or strangers would uh, come to our home and before they would come, uh, my grandmother and I would move the furniture allowed around um, and she would bring out these paintings and lean them against the walls in our little uh, small living room. And what I remember is the reverence with which uh, guests would come in and watch, um, you know, they would come, they would take the slippers and shoes off at the door and they would um, stand uh, and watch the paintings in silence. I remember one of the paintings was called uh, Babi Yar. I didn't know what it meant. Um, I asked my grandmother and um, when I asked, she did not explain to me what it was. Um, and she just quickly turned the painting away. Um, and this is, this is, I'm sorry, it's a terrible uh, reflection, but this is, this is the painting. Um, so it was not uh, until I was in my 20s and my grandmother was gone and I was living in America that I learned uh, what Babi Yar meant. It's a Holocaust site near Kiev where thousands and thousands of Jews were killed. So my grandmother would speak about uh, the siege and about the war, but never about Holocaust. Um, so, but um, we knew uh, that these paintings were important. And my mother decided that she would emigrate um, to the United States and take the paintings with us um, so she would be free to preserve, to conserve, and to exhibit them. Uh, so this was 1979, just uh, before uh, the Soviets invaded, uh, invaded Afghanistan and before the Olympic Games that would be banned uh, by the countries in the West. Um, so my grandmother was able to receive, so, so, so because of Iron Curtain, no one could um, uh, no one uh, could leave freely, but Soviet Jews were allowed to emigrate with special permission. And um, my grandmother was able to receive this um, exit visa, and she took most of the paintings out of the country. Uh, a year later, or several months later, my mother and I were also able to get the exit visa, and we were getting ready to leave. Um, and then I came home uh, from school and saw three men from Soviet police uh, searching our home. They um, went through my personal things, my clothes, uh, my mother's clothes, our pillows, mattresses. And after they left, uh, they took away our visas. We could not leave. Uh, my mother was charged with a uh, crime. She was innocent. The persecutor, when he received the case, said there is no criminal case here. Uh, there is nothing to persecute. 
uh, the KGB got involved. Um, and she went to her trial. Uh, I was waiting for her um, to come home, but she didn't. Um, she received a prison sentence. Um, and um, yeah, so she, I was 11 years old and I was left without a family. So this, what I want to say is that the same forces that send my mother uh, to prison, an innocent person, um, are still at work in Russia today. The same people, the same KGB, now under a new name, uh, FSB, and the same system, what's more importantly, the same system of beliefs that a human life is worthless and that people are pawns in the hands of a small group of uh, secret agents. This same system of belief is uh, doing its work today in Russia and Ukraine. And now innocent people go to prison simply for saying no to war. My mother had uh, received a year and a half prison sentence, and it may seem mild compared to 15 years uh, that people receive for just protesting a war. But I can tell you that when I was 11 and she did not come home, my universe collapsed. And, and I want to say, and I, I want to believe that this experience made me stronger. It made me more resilient and it probably helped me achieve certain things that I set out to do in life. But I also have to be, I have to tell you that that experience is with me every day. Uh, that even now, 40 years later, uh, I never can have this feeling of certainty that you can count on things to be, you know, the way they set out to be. That you always live your life with this anticipation of some catastrophe. Some You're always finding, you know, you're always on the lookout for something to go wrong. And um, you're always trying to prevent a disaster. And I think it also affects uh, the way I um, parent my children. So when what I want to say is that when mothers, uh, whether regardless whether they're guilty or innocent, go to prisons, I think it sets uh, in motion a certain chain of events and it affects children that they leave behind, the elderly that depend on the help and the care of their adult um, daughters. Um, and it's also a tremendous, I think, em emotional burden for, for the mothers when they are separated from their children. So um, I want to read a small excerpt uh, of a letter uh, that uh, my mother uh, wrote to me from prison, uh, from, from labor camp in 1982. My beloved precious girl, always remember this. Everything that you find serious is serious to me a hundredfold. And what you find hurtful is my tragedy. I have little interest in things related to my own person, but each one of your tears is my sobbing. Your smile is my laughter. I don't want to write about myself, but I know, but, but please know that I'm fine and my stay here should not inform your worries. Do you understand? Most important to me is your spirit, your mindset, your life. The rest is meaningless. I feel your mood swings even at a distance and they cause identical swings in me. Dochinka, my darling, there are only 11 months and few days left. We will be together again. Uh, we must learn to find good in everything bad that happens to us. Uh, what are you like now? I often ask myself this question. Please write to me, my good little girl, your mama. Um, so she 
couldn't write to me for the first several uh, months. But when she was allowed to write from the labor camp, she wrote every day. All the letters were um, read, uh, checked, uh, read by the warden. And we have to be very careful because one careless word could send her to um, a solitary or worse. Uh, but I have to tell you that these letters carried me through uh, the separation. And I still follow the advice that uh, she gave me from there. Um, when she came home uh, from prison, from labor camp, and then from exile in uh, Gorky, uh, we were homeless, and she had to work as a speed sweeper. Uh, so we have a room in a communal apartment. The room was big enough to fit our two beds and a desk. Um, and every six months, we would apply for immigration visa. And every six months, we would get refused, um, not in the interest of the state. Only after Gorbachev came to power um, and started Perestroika, uh, we were allow about uh, we were allowed to leave and i want to end um with a short uh, excerpt just before we left for the united states we visited um we visited uh, riga uh, latvia um in 1987 so just before um these uh, states separated from Russia. And I hope that this paragraph somehow serves as a hopeful message to what might happen uh, in that uh, region today. So we are, my mother and I are going to the train station to go to Riga. Russian pigs are coming, whispers a Latvian train conductor as he watches passengers board uh, Leningrad Riga train at the Rizhsky station. You don't know who is coming here. Mama zings back at him as we march onto our train. We spend a week getting lost in the winding streets of medieval rigor. Here the change is palpable. Students and other youths are gathering in the city squares. Tension is growing. Triggered by perestroika, glasnost, and the Chernobyl disaster, their protests will begin in part as an environmental movement, a response to Moscow's imposing plans on their land and the lead to a revolt against the Soviet occupation. In a few months, the singing revolution will begin. In the next several years, Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania will be the first three Soviet republics to separate from the Soviet Union and become independent democratic states. But for now, there is a brewing anticipation in the air, and I take it all in. So, thank you. Um, well, that that was that was great. Thank you, Yelena. Um, I uh, I just finished maybe last week. I finished reading Yelena's memoir, and it's you know I was I know what what happened. I read the book, but what what she was talking about right now, what she said, is so heart wrenching. Is and and that's what the book is. It's poignant, it's heart wrenching, and it's beautifully written. Uh, and it's interesting that we grew up in the same city, sort of overlapped almost at the same time. I know that Helena left um, a few years. After I did later, uh, you you know Gorbachev. I I did not know Gorbachev. I only watched Gorbachev from this country. Um, but but we lived in the same city and uh, we we sort of experienced the same Soviet lies and uh, that life that we lived um, was split in two. There was a real life that that we lived, and there was this facade of lies erected by the government, maintained and safeguarded by the system and its leaders. And um, in my novel, A Train to Moscow, uh, the characters also live lives split in two. Um, this is my first novel. I wrote two memoirs and, and then I 
realized that I had exposed every detail of my life in Russia and in America. So I wanted to write a novel, but of course I didn't know how to write novels at that point. So um, that was when I remembered uh, a quote from J uh, J.M. Kotsi, uh, the author of Disgrace and Waiting for the Barbarians, among other great novels. And his, his words are, all writing is autobiography. So I thought, well, he should know. <laughs> So maybe I'll try, I'll try to, it just, it made me wonder how much in a novel comes from a writer's life. Uh, this novel, A Train to Moscow, is set in Russia during and after World War II. And it's a story of a rebellious girl from a provincial town who strives to become an actress against her family wishes. And in that journey, she must uh, uh, oppose and struggle with the um, oppressive uh, politics of the Communist Party, an enigmatic lover turned political censor, and the buried secrets of her own family. It is about a conflict, uh, the conflict between the truth of art and the official curtain of lies that all Russians had to live with. It's really a love story. It's a love for a man, a love for the arts, and a love for truth. And the main character, Sasha, the one who becomes an actress, is based on my older sister uh, who was trained in the best uh, drama school in Moscow and then became a prominent actress working at a repertory theater in Leningrad in the 1960s and 1970s. And so all my teenage years I spent uh, in that theater backstage, in that glamour, of course, you know, my sister was an actress and I was a teenager. She, she is much older than I am. She's 13 years old, so she was an adult and I was still a teenager. Um, but all that, um, I, I wanted to, to be there, to spend time there, to pretend that I could also be an actress. But of course, even back then I knew I couldn't. But all that magic, the magic of that theater belonged to me as much as it belonged to her. And I sort of tried to remember every detail and I filed every detail of that theater into my heart to use, to use it later in my writing. Uh, my sister was born in 1942, and the time of the novel, the novel is set in during the war and after the war. So the time uh, of the novel's shortages of both food and men were burnt into her memory. But it was also the time of grief and fear. It was the time of Stalin's purges and uh, gulag labor camps. And there isn't a Russian family who doesn't know someone or of someone who was arrested or executed or sent to the northern fringes of the country to serve time as a political prisoner. In my family, it was my mother's uncle who was arrested in 1937 for telling a joke and he was sent to a, camp, to a labor camp and he never returned. Um, my mother also had two brothers who never came back from the war. Uh, one of them was an artist whose story is fused into this novel. Um, like Sasha's uncle, Sasha, the protagonist of the novel, like Sasha's uncle, he graduated from the Academy of Art in Leningrad. Um, and when the war broke out, he was drafted to the front. Unlike Sasha's uncle, he was mortally wounded and um, died at his home in Ivanovo at the end of 1942. The other uncle was stationed on the border of uh, the Soviet Union and Poland. And when the war started, I'm sure he was killed during the first hours of the war, but officially he's still listed as missing in action. In the novel, the two switched places. The artist became the one who was missing in action. And all those what if questions sprang to my mind, laying the groundwork 
for his story. What if he hadn't been killed, but uh, made it all the way to Berlin? What if he, unlike his staunch communist father, had questioned the infallibility of my righteous motherland and the facade of lies that was erected and safeguarded by its leaders? Other characters in the book um, are also based on real people. My mother was the mirror image of my motherland. She was overbearing, protective, and difficult to leave. She was not as harsh as Sasha's mother in the, in the book, but he, she was tough and controlling. She had to be. She was a survivor of the famine, Stalin's terror, and the savagery of war that she saw as a, a war surgeon. She worked at a frontline hospital during the war. Uh, yet she paled before a true authoritarian, my grandfather, who was this real uh, Bolshevik uh, believer. And I still remember his solidity and his um, unquestionable dominance. And everything, my grandmother was the glue that kept everything, the household together with her all encompassing love. Um, the characters uh, in the novel, in A Train to Moscow, also live in two entirely different realities. Just like we did, Yelena and I did growing up in uh, Leningrad. In one reality, we are, uh, we have, you know, the best ever harvests, and we see trucks delivering grain and meat somewhere on our black and white TVs, black and white back then. Um, citizens march in civil parades and thank the Communist Party. And life in Soviet Russia is a paradise envied by every capitalist country. In the other reality, there are empty store shelves there are communal apartments where several families share a kitchen and a toilet. Uh, there are closed borders. There are banned books and banned plays. This is the reality that we both lived in. Um, and the first made up reality, of course, is a huge state sponsored lie. And it is that lie that in the novel, in A Train to Moscow, comes in conflict with the truth of art. And for me, that was the most important conflict to explore. The truth of art, because art does not tolerate falsehoods, the truth of art versus the lie of the oppressive system. And if we have time, I, I could read a small, a short excerpt, about a three minute excerpt. Yeah. And just to give you a con the context, um, it, is, it is 1950 in Moscow. It is May 1st, which is International Workers' Day. It's a big holiday. Uh, it was a big holiday in Russia. And the main character, Sasha, is a, is a girl. She's a young uh, girl. Uh, and her mother takes her to this parade. So Sasha anticipates it. She, she had never been to Moscow before, and she's very excited to be part of this parade and to see, hopefully, to see Stalin on the Kremlin wall. Everyone starts walking. People with banners and portraits and red carnations made from construction paper swaying on wire stems. Her mother hoists her up onto her shoulders. So now Sasha is above the people's heads in the midst of a forest of swaying sticks with flags, banners, and portraits. She squints and peers to the left where everyone else is peering. There, five columns of people away, a group of men stands on the granite platform against the Kremlin wall. In the center is a separate dark figure in what looks like a military uniform. She knows it is Stalin, their conscience and their revolutionary glory 
as the radio reminds them every morning. He is the father to all of them, marching in this square and gathered around radios from here to Kamchatka, across all their 11 time zones. Only he is so far away, she can barely see him. He looks tiny and ant-like, and there is nothing glorious about him. Riding on her mother's shoulders, Sasha tries to lean forward to see him better through the forest of portraits and flags. She cranes her neck to peek under a rectangular slogan on two poles. And for a few seconds, the tiny dark figure flickers between the squares of red. But all she feels is disappointment. He looks nothing like the father they all know, grand and loving and immortalized in oil. Then the ant-like figure raises his hand and the square explodes. Every mouth in every lane and column splits open in one unified roar. And the forest of banners and portraits jolts and sways as if struck by a blast of wind. It is so terrifying that Sasha screams. But the May Day demonstrators are all safely below, and she is the only one trapped at the center of the storm. The poles of the slogan on her left are rattling by her ear. The sticks with portraits aim at her head from the right. Flags shake with crimson furor and hiss like flames, as if, as if someone has plucked her by the skin of her neck and is about to toss her into the gut of a wood-burning stove. The roar peals over the square like thunder, the mouths fusing into one howling throat, one hungry set of jaws with rows of sticks for teeth, ready to crunch and chew and spit her out. That's it. Thank you. This is hair-raising. This is a hair-raising uh, excerpt. It's, it's just it's 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 extraordinary because people believed in this man and 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 people i mean he he this that the human being can acquire this sense of almost a deity right the almost godlike figure that this masses would follow uh blindly i guess i guess lena i want to ask is there some do you think that there is something in Russian culture, in Russian history, that makes that makes the the people more prone to this kind of man worship. Mm. <laughs> um, well, you know, I um, I've heard people who are much smarter than I am discuss this and talk about it. And what I what I read is that, and what we know is that. Russia has never really known democracy. Uh, there was democracy between 1991 and 2000, and that was chaos and Wild West. And for a lot of people, it was a very difficult time where, you know, economy was was uh, in a tailspin. People lost their life savings. People lost their houses. It, it was just a very hectic time, very difficult time. Um, and that was democracy that Russians actually called Dermokratia, which means <laughs> shitocracy. <laughs> and then, yeah, and then Putin came to power in 2000 and he's still in power. So it's, it's always been these gods, these kings, the czars, the czars, you know, what do we, what, who is our next czar? The strong man. It's almost like there is a need for someone strong to... Uh, to to give us stability. What did people want? Why did they welcome Putin in 2000 and you know the years after? He promised stability, and he also promised. Um, he also said that he would return Russia's glory back. Russia was humiliated or felt humiliated on the world stage. It went from this um, Soviet, the USSR to a much smaller entity. Um, and it's, it's this, you know, Russia is, is rising from its knees. That's, that's what people who believe in Putin like to say. So, well, that's, 
<laughs> yeah. That's probably what it is, or something has something to do with that. I think the tragedy, the tragedy of, uh, you know, the opportunity loss, uh, lost is that over the 30 years, Russia could have rebuilt itself back into a great economy. But uh, the fact that, you know, all the wealth, all the rich, uh, you know, resources, natural resources, and all the labor, frankly, of people in the Siberia and the Urals, um, is all gets funneled back to Moscow and then out of Moscow it gets into you know Switzerland and God knows where London and um, into really wasted right into the bar stools on made out of whale skin in on the yachts and uh, mm -hmm. they didn't build the charity the, the this the communities all over so there is extreme poverty in the places outside of Moscow and Leningrad. And that's a tragedy, I think. Yes, yes, yes. I, um, as you know, because we both, we have written a memoir, both of us. So I wanted to ask you, Yelena, um, how were you able to remember everything so vividly? Um, did you need to go back and do research uh, for this book? And did you rely on friends and family to, to recount certain details? So no, I did not rely on anyone. <laughs> in fact, I did not tell anyone that I started writing. Um, I did not read books about uh, Russia. Uh, I didn't start reading you know, your, your memoirs and uh, other Russian authors until after this book was completely written because I did not want to you know, add someone else's memories to mine. And it was very surprising. I thought that everything was gone. But once you start writing, especially about your childhood, it's just, especially if you don't speak about it for 30 years, surprisingly, it's all preserved there in your memory. And it's just little by little, like a thread, it started to untangle and unwind and put itself on the pages. And the, and the most difficult part was probably organize all these disparate you know, memories into some kind of structure because I'm not able to work off the outline. And so trying to superimpose a structure onto something that's already written out of, you know, on the impulse is extremely difficult. So, um, yeah. Yeah. That's... And you, and can I bounce back the question to you? Oh, sure, sure. Um, yeah, I, I didn't, well, I, I, I didn't probably rely on, on any, on anyone else's memories. Um, but it's interesting what, what I just write in a memoir is a very dangerous thing. It may be, it may be very dangerous because the story involves not just you, but other people and your family members who may remember events differently. And when I was writing this, this memoir, I, I realized that um, memory is very tricky. There was, there was one particular uh, scene, one particular thing, my father's death and the phone call that they made into the hospital when they were told uh, that he had died. I was, I was 10. Um, I remember very clearly making that phone call that my mother gave me the, the you know, gave me the, we were in the phone booth, of course, no phones back then. Um, she gave me the phone um, receiver and I was the one asking and they told me he died. Um, and then when I was, after I had written it, I talked to my sister and I told her and she said, you didn't, she, she said, are you insane? Do you think our mother would give you the receiver <laughs> to talk to the hospital? You didn't talk, it was her. But I'm so clear in that memory that I left it. It's there <laughs> the way it is. Yeah. So it's, yeah, very tricky. I guess it's, uh, it's the way, in, you know, in painting, I think it's Picasso said once that, uh, you know, that maybe the, the, the hand twisted certain absurd way is not real truth in the real, real context, uh, but, uh, but it has to be true to that painting. So, so the phone call that you made 
is true to the no, to your memory. Absolutely, right? it's true so. to my memory. That's that's what I remember. And and it is. And I said to myself, it's my story. So I'm not <laughs> about that. Uh, but I also wanted to ask you, Elena, was um, was it a challenge for you to find the right voice for this memoir? Because I know that you did something interesting. Your one part is written in your mother's voice. Yes. And then, and then, of course, you were a young girl, and then, then you grew up, and and it's it, it encompasses twenty years of your life. So, was how was it? How was it difficult to find the right voice? I wasn't aware of of that. I wasn't aware of any of this. I think that um, because, so I always wanted to write this memoir, and I didn't want to write this memoir because I wanted to be a writer. Uh, I, I don't, I never anticipated or wanted to become a writer. I didn't have that dream. I had different dreams for myself, but I wanted to tell that story. Uh, and that story is very serious. And I didn't have a vision of how that story has to be at all. Um, in fact, I think my vision was that it would be very dry, almost journalistic, uh, uh, journalist reporters account of what had happened, kind of an expose of the KGB crimes uh, against my mother. Um, it was very important to me to give my mother her own voice. She never received justice, she was never acquitted. And to be honest, uh, you know, having that sentence uh, overturned in Russia by 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 this by this regime is pointless. It it will have no meaning while they are putting many, many scores of other people, you know, to prison for other fabricated crimes. And so just bear witness to what I had remembered and what I had seen and to give her the voice uh, to tell her story would be justice. So for people people reading it is uh, kind of set the record straight. We changed all the last, all the names, most of the names. So we, I, it is not my goal to, you know, revenge, to bring revenge to people who perpetrated those crimes. But I didn't want to tell what I remember. And I think the voice, if I found the voice, which I don't know if I did, um, it came from just difficulty of telling the story, the more difficult, pieces were very difficult to, re to write down. And so I just kept going earlier and earlier to the time when my life was good, the earlier childhood memories, the, you know, the blissful times playing in the forest and catching butterflies and making, you know, cooking, making dinner with my grandmother. Um, and I think you and I spoke about um, Frank McCourt, right? Right? You, you, you are lucky to know him. But mm -hmm. yeah. Just to say that reading his uh, Angela Ashes and all the other pieces somehow gave me permission to write some of these very mi minute, small moments. But please tell, yeah. Yeah, it's very interesting for me to hear that he, that he gave you permission. Uh, that's exactly how I feel about him. He gave me permission. <laughs> um, I, was, I was in his uh, workshop, summer workshop. Um, it was a very small group, uh, 12 people. And um, he was teaching it, and he was he was brilliant. He was as brilliant as a teacher, as a storyteller, as as he is on the page. Uh, very very funny, very ironic, and you know he 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 wrote he scribbled something on my submission. We all submitted a chapter or something to to get into this workshop, and he 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 just wrote something nice, something encouraging. And I thought, oh, oh, this is it. He allowed me. Now I can. Now I can write. Now I can write. And after that workshop, actually, the um, the voice, the voice changed. the The voice of the memoir. It sort of it became funnier. It became more ironic. It it like it was monochromatic before. Uh, and someone, even one editor, I sent it to said it's monochromatic. It's which clearly meant boring. Um, but after after that uh, workshop, it, it it the voice changed, and and then it very quickly you know it started. I you know some of the chapters were published in literary magazines, so so it was very consequential, 
and he was so he was so kind and he was so nice and so helpful and and we we sort of there was a connection between us you know sometimes you make a connection with a person um that that i felt that it was really a, like a watershed moment for for my writing that workshop it was 2004 yeah i was fortunate that uh, yeah i was in that workshop yeah i think i think so i think i think i was fortunate to read his book and to hear his uh, interviews on the on the, i think that um I think that one thing about his writing is he writes in present in present tense, and mm -hmm. I think that when when I started to think about writing in present tense, it brings you right that in that moment, for just just virtue of switching the into present, and 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 another thing is that he just you know the things that I would never allow myself to write is you know the, the dirty bathrooms or uh, he just made those things <laughs> worthy worthy you know literary attention so so funny you know there was italy italy was on the first floor and ireland uh, or italy was on the second floor and and, and ireland was on the first floor <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah he, he was very funny i think we have questions in chat if i'm not mistaken would becca becca would you like to ask or i think we yeah. have 10 minutes left right so we can yeah. get back to Perfect timing. Thank you both for that wonderful discussion. But yeah, it looks like we have questions in the chat. And if anyone else has any questions, feel free to drop them in. We have about 10 minutes. So we do have one question that asks, what was the hardest thing to write? And what are you working on now? Elena? Elena? Oh, you want me to go first? <laughs> um, well, the hardest thing to write in this latest novel, I, I imagine that was the question. Um, well, in the... The hardest thing to write for me was one character who is not based on anyone I know. <laughs> uh, and it's this, the love interest, and Andre, who becomes a party apparatchik and who becomes a censor for, for, the, for Sasha's work. He bans her plays. Um, he, was, he was very difficult to write because I only knew people like that in passing, I knew them through work, you know, I worked with, of course, you know, we all knew some party apparatchiks in the Soviet Union, but they were never my group of people. They were never my company. Uh, so I didn't know them well enough and I had to make him up from head to toe. So that took time, that was difficult. How about you, Yelena? Writing everything about it was um, both difficult and, but also very wonderful for for me to, I think, to spend time in my memory with some of these people who I left long time ago or who perhaps died, and I couldn't spend time with. This was the time to be with those people, and so I think there was really magic in in writing. I think there is just the time melts and you are just transported in a different world and. Uh, I, it's it's really lovely, difficult. It was difficult to go down to some of those difficult moments um, and to really put them in words. And uh, but maybe there was healing in that. Uh, structure is impossible, and editing is very difficult. And oh, cutting some dear pieces when you're you know when you're broke. <laughs> Feel your darlings. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, you love them all, but you know that it becomes. Yeah come you know over clutters and you have to yank them out and you have to tell yourself okay this will be a separate story so i have a lot of those separate stories somewhere in the folders right exactly to be to be written so wonderful um we have a question in the q a that asks if you see the same phenomenon of man worship as with sasha and stalin happening today even in democratic societies of man <laughs> oh of course of course we we have well i mean we can just look at president former president trump and his supporters and that that is still he's still worshipped by a certain a percentage of population who no matter what believe that he won the 2020 election despite all the facts they have alternative facts as we know um, that's what Kelly and Conway said. She actually used this phrase, we have alternative facts. So, 
yes, that's that is. I mean, if if you know, when I um, I never thought I, I perhaps I was naive, but I have lived here for many many years, uh, and I always thought that this is a democratic country, and nothing like Russia, nothing like the Soviet Union can happen here. No leader can usurp power like that, and. After 2020 election, after January 6, 2021, it is possible. It can happen here. I, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm not as naive anymore about that. I think people, sort of, people are people, and people have their own worshiping. They have their own idols, and uh, no matter what, they will believe what they believe. I think um, for me, um, so I, I had a very interesting conversation with um, this wonderful uh, writer and translator uh, from Moscow, who is now uh, not in Moscow, who had to leave uh, you know, a few weeks ago. And she was telling a story um, how in, 90, uh, in, the, in, in the late 90s, when P Putin came to power, um, she expressed concern. She was, you know, young and speaking with some senior uh, historian. Uh, her friend said, "You know, but 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 the KGB is coming back, you know, to rule the country." And and the old man said, "Oh, my dear, uh, you know, this will never, you know, the KGB is in the past, and the, we are in a new future now, and things that had there before will never happen again." Uh, and here we are. Um, in 1958, um, there was a historian, and I don't remember the first name, Toynbee, who wrote a short essay um, about man-centered religions, uh, Nazism, nationalism, and, um, and um, communism. And he wrote uh, that to counteract those uh, man-centered religions, man-worship, uh, the religions, the, the religions of the world that believe in some presence of something other uh, at the center of the universe, other than man, they have to find common ground, and that would be the count, you know, the counteraction um, to this uh, man, man-worship that I think leads to, yeah, to problems. It's, it's almost cultish, it's almost cultish. It's, it's, it's based on pure, it's like faith. It's based on pure faith. It's not based on any reality. And that's why these two alternate realities that existed in the Soviet Union and still exist in Putin's Russia, that there is a great piece in the New Yorker by Masha Gessen. It's about propaganda, Putin's propaganda machine. And she describes what you know, what the TV stations are saying, and how they cover this and don't cover that. And it is just—it's scary, of what they what they do and what they have been doing for twenty-two years under Putin. Because there, there, there is no independent source of news left at all, and mm -hmm. even Russians who want to find an you know, a, a website or, or something on YouTube have trouble doing that. You have to use um, VPN to get, you know, to get to those independent sources. And um, most, and those, those Russians who watch television only hear one record. And it's mm -hmm. one record, just repeated. Yeah, the mindsets, mindsets are formed manipulated yeah yes so as we're coming up on time i think we just wanted to thank everyone again so much thank you elena and elena for having this wonderful conversation please do remember to of course support your local bookstores if you're interested in buying either of these two books and this event will be recorded and posted later so if you want to watch it again you're always welcome but thank you very much for everyone for attending and I just want to thank everybody who attended also, and thank you for the questions. I know we didn't get to some of them, but uh, I'm looking at some of them are very interesting about the art and the, uh, and I wish we had more time, but maybe another, another presentation. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Becca. Thank you, Lena.
Thank you, Matthew.